Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. This time on Voice of the Sea. Next, we head to the UH Manoa campus where I catch up with Megan Mose, who is studying the diversity of invertebrates across the ocean. You can actually see some of the diversity of different types of uh, crabs that we'll find on arms. And these are some of the plates that are images of plates that came off of arms, where you can see a lot of different um, things growing on them, a lot of sessile stuff. There's probably some motel stuff in there too. If you look really hard, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's one right there. Um, and then, so this is the arms unit. This right here is to just display the incredible biodiversity there is on coral reefs. And so a lot of these pictures are from the Pacific. Um, they came from all different scientists and uh, photographers, that sort of thing. This is a new species of octopus that came off of a arms unit in Australia. So, and then um, there's some peanut worms, look a little different. And here's actually, we get a lot of these little shrimp right here that come off of the arms as well. They're clear with these brilliant maze patterns on the box. And then there's also, over here, we have more of the crabs that came off of the arms. All of these organisms would have come off of an arm. There's a uh, um, Sauron shrimp. There are a lot of different patterns. They kind of look fuzzy. Uh, there's uh, snapping shrimp. You can actually hear them make snapping noises. There's a spaghetti worm. They put, they go out trying to find food. So you see all these little feelers going out. And uh, nudibrain. So you find all sorts of different things on there. <coughs> and so we don't know what we have as far as new species on this yet. We're looking at some of it we do taxonomically, which so we look at it morphologically, and in other words, identify it by sight, uh -huh. and maybe looking through the microscopes. But other aspects, we'll actually use uh, DNA sequencing to try and pull it all together and see, okay, what do we have in these areas? And then from there, we say, okay, so we've got these, you know, these critters come, these organisms, these invertebrates come from Northwestern Hawaiian Islands or Australia or any of these places listed as well as others that we've now been deploying at. Uh -huh. And from there, we'll look at what they've collected, what we've collected, what the differences are. We'll also look over time as, you know, two years down the road, we pick this one up, we'll deploy new ones, and then two years later, we'll do the same thing and we'll look at how it changes. So. Very it's kind cool. Of the gist. And if you look on here, this is what we've done today. Is we've taken one of these arms and pulled it apart. We've actually got a model of it I can show you inside. And we pulled it apart and took the plates out. Uh huh. Just like this, kind of. And so you'll see these are the live things growing on the plates. But then these are some of the types of invertebrates, the motile stuff that moves, that you'll find hiding in the plates and living on them. Very cool. So it's like a little hotel. <laughs> Oh, they're beautiful. Yeah, no, you find it's an incredible amount of biodiversity. Um, we've actually got one of these. It's a pom-pom crab. And so it's a crab, and he's got little anemones holding that he, on his claws. And they have a sort of a symbiotic relationship. And so what will happen uh -huh. is, um, you know, when the crab's stirring up stuff, it'll, you know, it, it actually gets food uh -huh. and, and vice versa. And there's protection in there too. So those anemones permanently live on his little mm -hmm. claws? And some you'll find little, uh, little hermit crabs that'll have anemones on their shells. And it's another symbiotic relationship where let's say, you know, if a predator comes in, it, the anemone will sting the predator so it protects the crab or it's a way of hiding. Uh -huh. And then the crab will stir up food and then that'll get its food and then the anemone gets to eat it. So um, all of these, what we have, the pictures inside are from general biodiversity of coral reefs. Like I said, the highest biodiversity of coral reefs is going to be primarily invertebrates and there's also microbes but that'll, that's what makes up the incredible biodiversity. So 
Awesome. Well, take me inside and okay. show me what you have. What happens is we've got a lot of partners. So this is a big sort of partner effort. Uh -huh. So we developed it, and it was NOAA leading it, and then there's also Smithsonian, and there's also Scripps, and uh, the Australian Institute for Marine Biology, or for, I'm sorry, for Marine Science, Australian uh -huh. Institute for Marine Science. In the past, they had a similar, um, it was the LA County Museum of Natural History uh -huh. had, had actually developed the original arms, which were all concrete, so they were really heavy, and we worked with them on, well, not only were they heavy, but you had all these little pores to try and get things out right. of, which was next to impossible, it sounds like, so this is where we simplified it. We tried several different methods, and so the arms plates you'll see here we're using for outreach, they um, are a different model. They were one of the earlier models. Uh -huh. So they've got some of the little structures attached on them. So it's slightly different. But, but anyway, they collect a lot of similar things. But this material is, uh, the organisms are able to adhere to it, but they're not going to get stuck inside. So it's a, a nice place for you to be able to observe wetlands. Right, right. So basically, you know, you've got all the sessile stuff that collects onto the flat part uh -huh. and then the motile stuff that gets in there once we take the plates apart it's really easy to just pop it apart and say okay we've got this we've got this and we actually use sieves to look at different size organisms and um, make sure we get everything out of the sand because we'll get a lot of sand collected in there as well very neat can you take me a take little me bit through, through sure. and show us what some of the plates okay. look like okay you can kind of see them move around, they find their little hiding places in these, in these nooks and crannies. Oh, very cool. So you can see him. And there's, I'll show you another brittle star later that's a little different from that one. Um, what we have the kids do, and, and anybody who comes to look in the trays, is we actually have them look in the shells to see if there's a crab in there or a mollusk in there. And you can see by you know the legs and the, and the little claw coming out if it's a hermit crab. This one, let's see. I was hoping he'd come out and turn over for us, but he seems to just be staying inside, so I'm just putting him away. But yeah, so they all hide in here. And then here we go. This is like what I showed you out there. Uh -huh. This little sea urchin. Can and I put him on my head? Yeah. And they move around the tank. So, you know, some are going to be really sharp and pointy and you wouldn't want to put them in your hand. Oh, I can feel him moving. Mm -hmm. He'll move all around the tank. Or all around the ocean, for that matter. So these arms were outside of uh, Kiwalo Basin for about two years. And what we did is we put some out for outreach and some for succession studies. So the succession study is to look at if you bring an arm up after one year, what are you, how much are you collecting on it? If you bring it up after two years, what are you collecting? If you bring it up after three years, what are you collecting? And so then when we do that, we can then compare with other groups who's bringing out their arm after one year, or if another group is on a, has to is, has to rely on a vessel that can only go out every two years, we know what types of things we're collecting. So we have these succession studies in Panama, um, here, and a couple different places. So the, those succession studies are kind of like your baselines then mm -hmm. for the comparison mm -hmm. to the other places. Yeah, yeah. And um, well, I mean, some of them. There's also all of this is going to be baseline. So all of these arms that we've deployed around the world, it's fairly new and it's, it's, it's in its infancy as far as our deployments. We've just collected some back recently. And um, so when we do this, it's all coming back with baseline information. And then the years to come will then tell us, okay, how is this changing over time? How can we compare to these other places? That sort of thing. And um, let's see, this guy right here is a peanut worm. And I think I might have told you about the peanut worm earlier. There's some way, there's, they have different patterns. There's some that are brown. And uh, I'll find one that's a little more active for you to, to look at. All of the stuff on here is live. 
And so a lot of times what you'll do is, in order to find some of the tiny, tiny cryptic things, is you'll look under shells, you'll look in the algae. Sometimes there will be a crab hiding in amongst you know, the different organisms. Mm -hmm. So, And there will be times where you'll see a crab attached to a crab attached to a crab. It's a whole bunch of little crabs, and you know, some are fighting, some are hiding, that sort of thing. But. And do you identify all of the different, the, the algae, the crustose algae, the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, primarily we're focused on this effort because it's such an intensive effort and man hours and things. Primarily we're focused on the invertebrates. Okay. Um, there is definitely algae that comes off of that. That'll go into the sequencing as well, mm -hmm. and they do the DNA sequencing. What we're trying to do with the sequencing is actually, because there's not enough taxonomists or the taxonomists that there are, there's not enough time or money for them to identify all of this. What we're trying to do is take everything and put it together and blend it and then look at mass parallel sequencing and actually see, okay, what are the sequences that come out of this entire blender? And then we'll, some of the sequences will be able to compare to sequences that have been done and actually identified by taxonomists. Uh -huh. And other sequences will be um, things that we don't know about. But we can still keep track over time as to how these sequences change. So I'm not sure. Let's see what we have in here. So this right here is a tube where a worm is inside. You'll see a lot of those that are they're really hard and crusty. Mm -hmm. You'll see a lot of those actually on the plates. Are these also mm -hmm. tubes then? Yeah, those are tubes. Um, there's a little hermit crab. Oh, oh. Wait, watch this guy. <laughs> this guy will probably try and turn over for us. See him coming oh, out of he shell. gets so much of his body out. Yeah. Oh. He's actually so he curls around in there, and he's got little hooks that hold him in in the, in the very back. This is an active peanut worm right here. What he's doing is, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but what he's doing is he's going searching for food, and when he finds that food, he brings it back inside of his body. And then, he'll, and then his mouth will come back out and it'll get really, really long again. They're, uh, the scientific is uh, cypunculid. Oh, whoa, here we go. <laughs> Lots of stuff hiding under here. So a lot of times what you'll do is you'll flip it over and you'll see all these little critters that were hiding. There's a, a crab. They come in all, they're very diverse. They come in all different uh, colors and sizes. And some are true crabs, some are hermit crabs. This is, let's see, crab in there. Crab. Yeah. So yeah, go to the next side. we can find in here. Okay, this one has a lot of sessile stuff collected on it. Um, I do believe there's a uh, brittle star that's been a little bit damaged in the process. Um, you can see a worm that's hanging out on here. You'll find a lot of different types of worms on these. They're uh, polychaetes and, and different types. There's a little crab. A lot of times the way when you see some of them, you can tell that they're <laughs> what they have on their backs and things is to help them hide. Mm -hmm. So, and there are a couple of mollusks. Mm -hmm. A couple of bivalves. And let's see here. What else do we have? Oh, here we go. So here's an interesting little crab that's hanging out on this side. And actually, I get this guy off. There's a snapping shrimp. Let's see if we can get them off of that. Maybe a spoon. There's a lot. We collect quite a few snapping shrimp on these. All different types, all different colors. We find orange ones. We find green ones, like this little guy. And they make snapping sounds. There we go. Oh, he's very cool. Yeah. So they make little, you can hear them, actually, um, when you're when you're sorting through these arms and, and there aren't so many people, you can actually hear them making snapping sounds. And there's other little ones that are out there. There's a crab. Sometimes things will hide in the shells. Doesn't look like anybody's hiding in there right now. Um, let's go to this one. There is actually a brittle star, another type. It's very pretty. 
Mother. You're welcome too to poke around with the spoon. And, and what you're looking for are extremely small organisms. There's a worm right here. You can see him oh, yeah. yeah, he's a really short little guy. And actually, what do we have here? Lots of different things you can see in here. Yeah, this is a little fire one. Also a polychaete, yeah. Mm -hmm. Also a polychaete, segmented. We have a lot of fire worms that come out of these. Do you use gloves when you're sorting them normally, or do you use a tool? Do, I'm sorry? Do you use, wear gloves when you're sorting? Um, when we're pulling things apart, originally we wear gloves because you can cut yourself and get an infection. So we're really careful about that. Uh -huh. um, when it comes down to something like this, we've pretty much made sure everything is safe and then we put it out for outreach. When it, if we're sorting the smaller organisms, say in these trays like this, we'll actually just use spoons and tweezers. Mm -hmm. And so you don't really need the gloves because we're not picking them up with our hands. A lot of them are very fragile and that's one thing we try to do with these outreach events is explain to the kids how fragile these organisms are and how all this stuff is living. So you don't want to step on the coral reefs because you're going to be killing little animals and you're going to be killing the homes of little animals. And so it's one thing we really try to push is show them Wow, look at all these amazing little animals that are out there. And how can we protect them better? So. Very cool. Thank you. No problem. I guess I have one more question. Um, when you're sorting, you do you count for numbers? Do you also do biomass? We do. Um, what some, it depends on the effort. Um, when we're on the cruises, where we go up to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands or to um, American Samoa, it's very fast paced. And so it's really hard to sit there and count organisms and identify them right on the spot. So we'll sort them we'll, or even put them in jars, depending on how much time we have, and uh -huh. then sort them later. Uh -huh. So right now we're in the process of sorting a bunch of um, arms organisms that came from the Mariana Islands. Uh -huh. And so while we do that, we go through, go through the trays, find every one that we can find, and then we put them in groups of who they belong with, their, whether it's family or down to species, whatever we can identify. And then we put them in vials. We've preserved them in ethanol. As soon as we bring them out, Unless we need to take pictures of them or identify them, we immediately put them into ethanol, which locks them down in a more gentle manner, <laughs> putting them to sleep, and also preserving them both for future analysis as well as for the DNA sequencing. We try to mostly deploy in coral reef habitats, but some of our partners are working on deploying deeper sea and different habitats, that sort of thing. So we're going to be able to see a lot coming from it. Megan, how did you get interested in working with the ARMS project? Wow. Long history. Let's see if I can keep it short. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, I've worked for NOAA since 2002, and I've done a lot of things. I've helped with marine debris as well as um, mapping efforts and as a dive master for the teams. But what brought me into this was I was part of a larger project called the Census of Marine Life. Uh -huh. And within that project, there's 17 different projects that um, are studying specific realms. We were studying coral reefs. There's other groups that are studying sea vents and deep sea, that sort of thing. With coral reefs, we then wanted to look at, OK, how can we collect more information on the lesser studied things like the invertebrates, the algae, the microbes? So with that, we then looked at what kind of um, instruments we needed to use. We brought together workshops of, of leading scientists to do this what types of um, organisms we needed to collect and where, and to kind of get a, a general idea of some of the things that were out there. And so then we worked with partners with the Florida Museum of Natural History, with LA County, with some partners in Brazil and all different places, and 
to develop just the right methods, and the ARMS was one of the products. And so we tested an ARMS at French Frigate Shoals when we did an entire census there, where they did all different methods. And we've modified it since to come up with the arm that has the flat plate and the crossbars. Uh -huh. And um, so what happened is I was helping coordinate these groups and working with these groups, and then I would see what came off of these arms. <laughs> and I was just fascinated because you know, we have scientists and people walk by when we're sorting, uh -huh. and everybody just wants to come in and see what's there. And you know, they might be an oceanographer or a mapper or whatever you and yet they want to come in and see what's in there and it's I, I can't even express how much I didn't realize was out there of the tiny little cryptic things and so that's what drew me in was just the fascination and also the need because the need is definitely there to, to provide more information so. well we're very lucky to have you doing this project for the scientific community and public well there's a Thank whole you. group of us <laughs> So no problem, but I could uh, help out. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii Sea Grant. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG has been providing quality educational programs and services for over 40 years, serving students, teachers, parents, educators, and experts around the world and here in Hawaii. The Curriculum Research and Development Group Improving Schools, Improving Education. CRDG. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is a dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. Teaching ocean science concepts through the disciplines of physics, chemistry, biology, and ecology. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now available freely online. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. Turn your love of the ocean into a lifelong career. Join NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as we unlock the secrets in the deep oceans, track rapidly moving storms, model climate trends, protect and preserve our marine resources, and so much more. It's all in a day's work at NOAA. Find a career that makes a world of difference, enriching life through science, service, and stewardship. NOAA.